We had stopped the enemy before he could reach the Mars. Now he could either abandon his winter offensive or try to maintain the bulge in order to slow down our advance. A field marshal model endeavoured to forget the battle cry to Antwerp, with which he had tried to rally his troops on the offensive only a fortnight before. We have succeeded, he wrote in his New Year's address to his troops, trying to find some justification for the Battle of the Ardennes, in frustrating the enemy's planned attack on our homeland. However, this was too unconvincing an alibi. It could not justify the losses suffered by the Germans in the unsuccessful offensive in the Ardennes, disrupt our plans and force us to delay the offensive, at best for a few weeks. The enemy managed only at the cost of losing the offensive power of 24 divisions. Rapid withdrawal from the Ardennes ledge could still save the Germans' reserves sufficient to defend the line along the Rhine River. However, instead of abandoning the territory captured in the Ardennes, and occupying the siege fried line. The German command decided that it could hold us off. The siege fried line all along the Western Front was still intact, except for our 165 kilometer wide indentation near Aachen. Simple common sense demanded that the enemy should occupy the siege fried line with a minimum number of troops and gather reserves for the subsequent defense of the line along the Rhine River. However, a sound military assessment of the situation was set aside in favor of the fanatical claims of Hitler, who demanded the defense of every inch of the sacred land of the Reich, without considering that such tactics could prove to be empty fanfare. As a result, the enemy abandoned the Rhine, that most reliable defensive frontier in all of Western Europe, in order to fight recklessly to the end west of that river. His endeavor to delay us for a few weeks longer in the Ardennes led to the collapse of the entire Western Front. As soon as the Germans had entrenched themselves on the Ardennes bulge and gone on the defensive, the forests, mountains, snow, and washed-out roads, which had helped us to hold back the enemy's advance, now turned against us. Our newfound initiative, however, surpassed the advantages that the weather and terrain had given the enemy. These two weeks in the Ardennes were my only experience of defensive warfare, and I was very glad when at last we were again on the offensive. In all, Runstead held the initiative for only eleven days, a pleasure too brief, considering the sacrifices it cost him. Now that the dream of Antwerp had faded and the hopes of stopping the Allies had dissipated, the morale of the Germans plummeted, and the enemy moved despondently along his usual road of retreat. Henceforth, there was no going back to the offensive for him. The insufficient road network in the Ardennes forced the enemy to limit himself to transporting only ammunition and fuel to supply the German tanks that had broken through. Troops were ordered to forage for their own food until they reached Antwerp, where fabulous stores of war materials accumulated by the Allies were waiting to be plundered. However, the sparsely populated Ardennes did not allow German foragers to deploy and the forward field depots of American troops managed to capture only 40,000 rations. First Diftvith, then Bastome, finally cold and starvation. It was bitter food for soldiers who had been promised victory and plentiful American supplies. An irritated prisoner of war from the 6th SS Panzer Army growled angrily when he heard the name of his army commander under interrogation. Hmm, Septitrich, he said sharply. He wouldn't even make a butcher. Stytrich had joined the army in 1914, before which he had been a butcher's apprentice. He joined Hitler in 1923, and five years later joined the National Socialist Party. In 1932, he was promoted to the rank of brigadier general in the SS forces, and became commander of Hitler's bodyguards. In contrast to the enemy, whose morale had been shattered, our troops were eager to fight, despite the blows they had received. When the 5th Rangers Battalion, in need of 50 soldiers, appealed to the rear units of the 1st Army with a call for volunteers, a waterfall applications fell on it. Its volunteers totaled about 1,000 men. In 16 January, the armies of Hodges and Patton joined on the cobblestone streets of Euphalis. Although not a month had passed since the day when von Rundstedt's columns entered this small town, I still remember this sleepy little place on a hillside 16 kilometers from Bastogne, where the asphalt road to Liege passed through. Down in the ravine below, 
A sawmill hummed with the soaring of tall, straight trunks of Ardenness pines. Two parallel rows of stone cottages lined either side of the liege road, which only in one place was crossed by a road running from west to east. To deprive the enemy of the possibility of using this road, our heavy bombers destroyed the town. Bulldozers, clearing Patton's way north to join the First Army, piled the smouldered stones of the ruins of Ophelais into craters formed by Allied air raids. A simple, poor and humble little town no one bothered to live in. It was destroyed only because it was located on one of the unremarkable crossroads. This crossroads turned Uffalis into a target of greater strategic importance than any town fifty times its size. On the evening of 17 January, 1st Army rejoined 12th Army Group. However, the 9th Army remained under Monty's command because Eisenhower had promised the British Field Marshal to leave him this army to participate in the offensive on the Rhineland. I begged Eisenhower to return the 9th Army to me, if only for 24 hours. This would allow us to complete the entire cycle, and after the elimination of the Ardennes, it bulged to reassemble all American formations under American command. But Ike replied that he is already completely exhausted in the fight with the British, demanding the appointment of Monty as commander-in-chief of the land forces. He said that he was not going to again enter into bickering with the British just to appease the wounded ego of the Americans, that the Ninth Army will remain in the 21st Army Group until we do not force the Rhine. Simpson, having learnt of Ike's decision, called me on the phone from Maastricht. Look, Brad, he said, laughing, what can you do to save us? If it goes on like this, the British will think that we were given to them along with the goods under the Lend-Lease. There's nothing we can do, I replied. Ike has already given his word. You'd better take care of your English pronunciation. You're going to need it for a while. The enemy counteroffensive as a strategic operation ended in total failure. The Germans not only failed to achieve their ultimate objectives beyond the Meuse, but also paid extremely dearly for the delay of our winter offensive. According to our intelligence, enemy losses for a month of fighting exceeded 250,000 people, including more than 36,000 prisoners. More than 600 German tanks and self-propelled guns were left to rust in the Ardennes forests. Even German aviation shared the defeat of Rundstedt, making the only and last attempt to support the actions of ground troops. On 1 January, Goering organized the most powerful airstrike of the entire campaign in Europe. At first, German fighters took more than 125 Allied aircraft by surprise and destroyed them on Belgian airfields. But Allied fighters who took to the air in flocks that day destroyed, according to pilots, 200 German aircraft by the end of the day. At the time when the enemy was withdrawing from the Ardennes, the pitiful remnants of its last reserves in the west, in the central section of the Soviet front, the Red Army again went on the offensive. It began on 12 January with a crushing artillery preparation. Five days later, on 17 January, Soviet troops entered Warsaw, which had been razed to the ground by the Germans in retaliation for General Berkomarowski's uprising that began on 1 August. Over the 63 days of the uprising, more than 250,000 Poles had risen to fight the Germans in Warsaw, while Red Army troops waited quietly in Warsaw's suburb. Plague, just a few kilometers to the east. On 22 January, Soviet troops crossed the border into Silesia and reached the Oder River the next day. Hitler hastily gathered all that remained of the 6th SS Panzer Army of General Dietrich and urgently transferred this remnant by railway to Hungary, where the immediate threat of a breakthrough of the German front. However, if in our intelligence reports Army Septitricia was listed as a tank army of five divisions, but now from this formidable force remained a mere shadow. The last German reserves that could have held off the onslaught of Russian divisions had been used up in the Ardennes. Hitler's failure in the Ardennes not only hastened the defeat of the Germans on the Western Front, but also brought closer the collapse of Hitler's army on the Eastern Front. Undermining the morale of the German people as a result of the crushing defeat in the Ardennes was more important than its strategic impact on the new Russian offensive. Firstly, weapons on which the Germans had long pinned their hopes proved unable to change the course of the war. 
Now they could no longer hope for a lightning strike. True, the German people, except for the most hardened, fanatical Nazis, had long since lost faith in victory. But before the Ardennes battles, many believed that if Germany could achieve stability on the Western Front, it could force the Allies to make a separate peace. This would allow the Wehrmacht to throw all its last reserves against the Soviets. However faint this hope had been, it was now gone too. Realizing that their days were numbered, the Germans were desperately trying to come to terms with the overwhelming thought that a tragic end was inevitable. Not so long ago, entering at Snout and Duren, our troops found extinct towns abandoned by the population. Now, all the way to the Elbe, we marched under an arch of white flags. Unlike Hitler, the Germans had become remarkably prudent, and the voice of reason was forcing them to hang sheets out of their windows as a sign of their readiness to surrender. At the end of January, when the enemy gave up the last shred of the Ardennes bulge and withdrew to the Siegfried Line, nine more German divisions were transferred to the Russian front. But even after this, Rundstedt still had 80 divisions against our 71. Many German compounds suffered heavy losses, were poorly trained and understaffed. But all these shortcomings were largely offset by the fortifications of the Siegfried Line, except for a small section of 65 kilometers, where we broke through to the Ruhr River. This powerful defensive line remained intact from Arnhem to the Swiss border. Two months later, during breakfast with Churchill at Eisenhower's headquarters in Reims, in the house of the King of Champagne, Ike and I had to prove the difficulty of overcoming the Siegfried Line. For unlike the French, who had miscalculated their Maginot line. The Germans knew how to capitalize on their investment in com Few Americans at the time realized the large German ground forces still confronting us on the Western Front. Despite the lesson we had learned in the Ardennes, we retained our September illusions. It seemed to us that we had defeated the remnants of the German army when a delegation from the War Production Committee visited us in January. I was asked whether the Ardennes offensive by the Germans would prolong the war. I replied that it would not except in the minds of some people. The Ardennes offensive could only surprise those who thought we had finally defeated the Germans in September, I explained. It would be good if the Ardennes convinced these people at least that the German could still kick us pretty hard. American troop losses for the month of fighting were about one-fourth of the losses that according to our data, suffered by the Germans. We lost 59,000 men in combat, including 6,700 killed and 33,400. The remaining 18,900 men were listed as missing in action, although it was assumed that most of them were surrounded during the German breakthrough and taken prisoner. These were mostly soldiers from units of the 106th and 28th Divisions most of them liberated by Allied forces from prisoner of war camps at the end of the war. When the war ministry announced that the combat losses for the month of the German offensive in the Ardennes exceeded those of any previous month, it did not see fit to add that many more divisions had taken part in the Battle of the Ardennes. In the month preceding the German breakthrough, our losses were expressed as 46,800 men and no more than 17 divisions were involved in the fighting. On 17 January, we threw into battle 27 American divisions. This was almost four times the number of American divisions then fighting in Italy, and exceeded also the total number of American divisions involved in the Pacific theater of war. But if our losses were great, the enemy's losses were much greater. Moreover, our losses were less than if the Germans had struck us on the plains of Cologne, or if they had brought their reserves into the battle when we approached the Rhine. In pursuit of the retreating American troops in the Ardennes, the enemy came under our fire. Especially devastating was the fire of our shells with radio fusées, which exploded in the air. Soldiers of the 4th Division, still not forgetting the losses suffered in the Gurchin Forest, such a change of roles gave a lot of pleasure. There was a time when we had a hail of shrapnel raining down on our soldiers, while the Hans were holed up in their holes, explained Colonel Lanham, an undersized but well-trained officer, a poet in command of the 22nd Infantry Regiment. 
In the Ardennes we just sat in the trenches on tin cans and hit the Huns as soon as they came near us. I don't know what it was like in other areas, but in ours the Germans fought well. We made sure they were brave soldiers. By the end of January we had eliminated the Ardennes bulge and approached the Siegfried line. The First Army was concentrated on a narrow front between the Gürtgen Forest and Stathvitus, while the Ninth Army positioned itself to the left, occupying part of Hodges' section on the Ruhr River. Patton pulled the main forces of the Third Army to the strip of enemy fortifications running along the Luxembourg border to the Moselle. The front of Patton's Third Corps stretched 50 kilometres south of the Moselle, and in the vicinity of Saar Lawton adjoined the front of Army Group Diversa of the 47 American divisions operating on the Western Front. 21 divisions were squeezed in the narrow area between the Gürtgen Forest and the Mose. I wanted, without reducing the pace of the offensive, to break through the Siegfried Line, overcome the Eiffel Massif and break through the passage to Bonn and the Rhine Deer. Despite the fact that this direction was rugged terrain, it offered two great advantages in one. By striking in a direct line to Bonn, we could get rid of the loss of time inevitably associated with the regrouping of forces necessary to organize an offensive in any other area. 2. The way through the Eiffel allowed us to bypass the dams on the Ruhr River from the south and reach the Rhine, without engaging in protracted battles for the possession of the dams. We had already suffered losses in two previous offensives in the area of the dams, and I wanted to avoid a third. However, Montgomery was not slow to make adjustments to our plans. In the early days of November, when we began the winter offensive, Eisenhower promised that in the event that the First and Ninth Armies, by the end of the year, did not come to the operational space, he will withdraw the Ninth Army from the Twelfth Army Group and transfer it to Monty for the offensive north of the Ruhr River. Now Monty caught Eisenhower on the word and, referring to the impending British offensive, opposed my proposal to send the First Army through the air. He insisted that Hodges return to the position on the Ruhr River, which he held before the Battle of the Ardennes. From this point Hodges was to advance on the dams with the task of ensuring that Simpson forced the Ruhr, which having taken possession of the dams, the First Army crossed the Ruhr and covered the right flank of Simpson's Ninth Army moving towards the Rhine. But Eisenhower had no choice and had to give in to Monty's demands. Not only did we fail to reach the line that we were supposed to occupy by 1 January, but our advance towards the Eiffel was slowed by snowdrifts up to two meters thick. In addition, our first strikes on the Siegfried Line did not yield any results. Only in the neighborhood of Achaean in the Upper Rue this line had already been broken through. As a result, on 4 February, the Allied High Command ordered the 12th Army Group to stop the offensive in the Eiffel and move the 1st Army north to the same positions along the Rue River, which it occupied in December. Although I was not at all smiling at the prospect of advancing in the direction of the dams, Nevertheless, I could not but recognize that Ike was right in his decision. By switching the First Army to the northern direction, we could combine our forces with the British and make a concerted strike directly south of the Ruhr Basin in the direction of the Rhine. The Red Army offensive deprived Germany of the industrial areas of Silesia, and the enemy, more than ever, depended on the Ruhr Basin. In the Ruhr Dar, the Germans were successfully repairing the destruction caused by Allied bombers and showing marvellous initiative and ingenuity, had even achieved an unprecedented level of tank and aircraft production. If Monty had managed to break through to the Rhine, he would not only have deprived the enemy of the possibility of using this important waterway, but would also have been able without much difficulty to conduct artillery fire on the factories, which were densely dotted 15-kilometre strip of terrain on the east bank of the Rhine. Since the offensive of the First Army was to precede the general offensive Monty, Eisenhower suggested that I move the command post of the task force headquarters from Luxembourg to the north in Nama, an ancient fortress city located in the bend of the Myers 100 kilometers west of the German border. In Luxembourg I was ten minutes from Patton's command post and two hours from Hodges, 
Although Nema was only an hour and a half from the 1st Army's command headquarters, it was a three-hour drive from the 3rd Army's headquarters in Luxembourg. I protested, but I insisted on moving my command post, as he was keen that we should be closer to Monty's command post in Holland. For two months we were quartered in the picturesque Chateau de Nia, which overlooked the Myers Cliffs. During this time I saw Monty only three times. We spoke frequently by telephone, except during the periods when we were travelling rapidly through France, and so could do perfectly well without personal meetings. It was not until the end of January, when the American newspapers came to us in Luxembourg, that we saw the hysterical tone in which the High Command had given information to the press during the Ardennes fighting. From September onwards, Hansen asked me to set up a press camp at the headquarters task force, but I invariably declined the offer. I did not consider it advisable to organize press conferences halfway between the Army headquarters, where correspondents were available, and the Allied High Command, which organized press conferences on a theater-wide basis. At the same time, Montgomery did not scatter his correspondence across the armies, as we did, but concentrated them at the headquarters of the 21st Army Group. As a result, the British at press conferences, the results of the actions of the Canadian and British armies reported to correspondents in a generalized form. The value of information received by the American press was reduced due to the inability of correspondents assigned to the armies to understand the interdependence of the combat actions of different armies and to present a general picture of the situation. In this case, the headquarters of the armies often disoriented correspondents, as each headquarters was imbued with local patriotism and jealous of the successes of their neighbors. To the best of my knowledge, Correspondents received very scant and sketchy information at a press conference at the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Paris. As a result, the actions of our group of armies in the November and December offensives, subordinated to a single plan, turned into two unrelated campaigns on the pages of American newspapers. I have not forgotten the sad experience of the Ardennes battles when the newspapers were infiltrated with incorrect information that exaggerated the danger of our position. Wishing to avoid a repetition of such cases in the future, I reconsidered my point of view regarding the organization of a press camp under the headquarters task force. I informed the Supreme Headquarters of my intention to set up such a camp in Namur. A few days later we were visited by Eisenhower, to whom my proposal seemed suspicious. He did not raise the matter until late in the evening, after a game of bridge which we played intermittently. I thought that Captain Second Rank Harry Butcher of the Naval Reserve had probably planted a seed of doubt in the soul of his patron, otherwise Eisenhower would never have doubted the sincerity of our intentions. As Eisenhower's press chief, Butcher was clearly wary of our attempting to use the press in our disputes with Monty or, worse, of substituting the Allied High Command for the information press. I assured Ike that we only wanted to help correspondents to objectively report military events, and for this purpose we were going to organize a daily press conference with a summary of the general situation in the operations group of the headquarters. Eisenhower was satisfied with my explanation and gave his consent. To tell you the truth, Ike explained, I was not at all frightened by the Ardennes offensive of the Germans until I read about it in an American newspaper. According to the plan, Montgomery's offensive in the Rhineland Palatinate was to consist of two successive phases. It was assumed that in the first stage Monty's Canadian army would advance southwards from Nijemegen along the plain between the Myers and the Rhine. It was believed that the Canadians would come to the rear of Siegfried's line where its fortifications faced the Mewus and cut off the enemy garrisons in front of the British Second Army. Once the Canadians began to build on their success, Simpson was to strike across the Ruha River and advance northeast to the Rhine, which flows past the Ruhr Basin. So with access to the Rhine, he had the opportunity to direct artillery fire on the Ruha factories until Montgomery could gather his forces and force the Rhine. While Simpson was advancing towards Dusseldorf, we had to cover his right flank with the forces of the 1st Army Hodges. 
Hodges's task on the Rue River River was first to occupy the heights between the Erft and Rhine rivers, and then to cover Simpson until the Ninth Army reached the west bank of the Rhine opposite Dusseldorf. Once the Ninth Army was firmly entrenched, the First Army was to resume its advance southwards towards Cologne. Having taken possession of this city, famous for its cathedrals, the First Army moved further south along the banks of the Rhine and cut off the German forces west of the Rhine. The influx of replenishments was still not sufficient to allow me to go on the offensive with the forces of all three armies, so Patton was ordered to consolidate in the positions he occupied. On 8 February the Allied offensive began, which in 30 days was to end with the destruction of German forces west of the Rhine. The 1st Canadian Army rushed out of Nishmagen, while Simpson's army bided its time on the Ruha River, Hodges ordered Hubner to seize the dams and gain a foothold on this river frontier. By 10 February the 5th Corps had captured the dams on the Ruhr River and drove the Germans into the dense forests east of the river. But before leaving the dams, the Germans blew up the locks. Muddy streams of water rushed into the river valley, the river overflowed, the water rose above the flooded banks by almost a metre. The sudden thaw caused the melting of the mass of snow in the Ethel Mountains, and soon dozens of turbulent streams of water rushed into the flooded river. Division commanders of the 1st and 9th Armies, stretched along the banks of the Ruhr, cautiously looked at the muddy and turbulent stream and prayed to God that the commander of the army group postponed the offensive until the flooding ends. Fearing that the forcing of the river would not end in failure, both armies decided to wait until the water receded. But now our intentions were quite clear, and I feared how the enemy might not strengthen his front in this section of the troops transferred from Eiffel, where Patton was instructed to sit in defence. There George probed the Siegfried line with battle reconnaissance. He did this not in preparation for a major offensive, but simply because he could not sit still. For the Third Army, defence was a most undesirable kind of fighting. Now, having obtained Eisenhower's approval, I ordered Patton to launch an offensive on the A. This offensive was to be conducted by forces sufficient to restrain the enemy in this area and prevent him from moving some of his formations to the Ruhr River. However, the forces involved in the offensive were not to be so large as to raise Monty's objections. The replenishment of units involved in this operation with a limited purpose could be realized at the expense of the 1st and 9th Armies, so far trampled on the Ruhr River. Saturn was to break through the fortifications of the Siegfried Line, and north of the Mosel leisurely reached the Kill River, a mountain stream running through Germany parallel to the border with Luxembourg, about 20 kilometers from the border. Here Patton was to create a bridgehead on the east bank of the river for a future offensive by large forces to the Rhine. But this offensive was not to begin until Monty had firmly established himself on the west bank of the Rhine opposite the Ruha factories. Seton, trying to disguise the violation of written orders of the Allied High Command, instructing him to adhere to defensive tactics, called the actions of the Third Army at evil active defense. His staff officers naively believed they were deceiving Ike's headquarters at Versailles. Moreover, there were rumors that I was allegedly involved with Patton in the conspiracy. However, my disobedience to the orders of the High Command was purely pretend as Eisenhower was in agreement with our plan, although neither Patton's staff nor my staff did not know about it. Despite Montgomery's objections, Eisenhower shared my opinion. He also believed that before attempting to force the rain with a large force, it was necessary to reach the west bank of that river along the entire length of the Allied front. Although Ike still did not reject our plan to force the Rhine in the area of Frankfurt and cover the Ruhar on both sides, nevertheless in the Allied high headquarters was a widespread opinion that Monty in competition with me occupies a more favourable treadmill. But even if Monty had got his way and insisted on an offensive in one direction east of the Rhine, my view of the need to reach the Rhine on a broad front remained valid, for even if we had to concentrate the main forces in the north, holding a small force of the rest of the front to the Swiss border, we still had to occupy such a line on which the enemy could not strike us at preemptive strike, and thus frustrate our plans. For this purpose, I argued, 
There was no better frontier than the Rhine, Ike agreed with me. He also thought it absolutely necessary to clear the Germans from the west bank of the Rhine before forcing it. No less tempting was the opportunity to destroy the German troops in the Rhineland Palatinate. By February, 85 German divisions were operating west of the Rhine. If we managed to encircle and destroy this grouping, the enemy would have no forces left to organize a stable defense on the east bank of the Rhine. Our most important task was not the capture of Berlin or any other city, but the destruction of the German army, for, once the Wehrmacht forces had been defeated, it would not have been difficult for us to seize other enemy installations. While waiting for the Ruhr to re-enter the banks, I impatiently measured my steps in the corridors of the Baroque palace which housed our command post at Namur. My workroom was the ornate drawing room of the provincial governor. On a frescoed wall between two groups of smiling cherubs hung a huge seven-meter-high map of the setting. A crystal candelabrum hung above my desk, and as I paced around the map, a magnificent oriental rug muffled my footsteps. The city of Namur had been the headquarters of the forward section of the communication zone until our arrival. That headquarters had willingly surrendered its claim to the city and ceded its place to the task force of my headquarters. Eagle Tuck, said the officers of the communications zone when we occupied the city, taking advantage of our privileged position as superior headquarters. You should have been called Eagle Tuck. I've been to Nîmes before. Once, returning to Luxembourg from First Army Headquarters, I spent an evening at the Hotel Hauskemp, which housed the headquarters of the forward section of the communications zone. I remembered the name of this hotel well. It was already dark and we stopped in the middle of the street to ask some soldier for directions to the Haaskemp Hotel. Was he a pin? Soldier was confused, but suddenly a hunch struck him. Did they really organize such a camp here? The cold winter of 1944 caused the Belgian inhabitants of Namur a lot of trouble. The Belgian government, which was following on the heels of the liberating armies, immediately introduced a monetary reform to get rid of the devalued paper money, that the enemy was using to undermine the nation's prosperity and enrich its speculators. At the same time, price and wage controls were established. Within a year, this firm stand taken by the Minister of Finance, Camille Gutt, had borne fruit. While the rest of Europe was in the grip of economic chaos, Belgium was on its way to revival. A week passed, but the water level in the Rouheur did not drop, so we decided to wait another week. In the meantime, there were signs of the enemy amassing forces in front of the front of the Ninth Army, either to choose one of two things, either to go on the offensive in flood conditions, or to expose ourselves to the risk of encountering strong enemy resistance. At that time, I was painfully worried about any delay, because every day that passed reinforced the false impression that the enemy had cracked us in the Ardennes more severely than was actually the case. In strategic terms, the postponement led to the loss of an opportune moment for an offensive. The Red Army had finally launched a successful offensive after a three-month hiatus that had lasted during our battle in the Ardennes. If only we could coordinate our offensive with the Soviet strike, we would deprive the enemy of the opportunity to maneuver his reserves between the eastern and western fronts. Although General Bull, chief of operations of the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, back in January returned from Moscow with the happy news of the upcoming Soviet offensive. Never Eisenhower doubted that the Russians managed to get to the west bank of the Oder during the winter offensive. Still, the Bull report inspired faith that the Soviet troops, going on the offensive, will weaken German resistance on the Western Front. If these hopes did not come true, if the Germans weakened their defense in the West, our frontline troops did not notice it. We continued to receive all information about the Red Army from the BBC broadcasts, but at the end of February we had the opportunity to communicate with Soviet diplomats for one day. One day the Soviet ambassador to France came to visit us in Neymar to present us with Russian orders for Operation Overld. After the official ceremony at the palace of the governor of the province, the ambassador, Mr. Alexander Bogomolov, a bureaucratic-looking man, spent the evening with us at the Chateau de Namur.
Next morning I invited him to a secret meeting at headquarters. We familiarized the Soviet ambassador with the disposition of our troops and the plan for the completion of the Rhineland Palatinate campaign. Turning to Paris with Colonel A. Drexel Biddle from the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, Bogomolov spoke admiringly of the reception he had received, emphasizing that we had kept no secrets from him and promised to report our hospitality to Marshal Stalin. However, these praises did not prevent me, five years later, from taking an honorable place on the list of Anglo-American warmongers compiled by the Soviet leaders. If I could have foreseen this result then, in 1945, I would have felt much more confident, for the British and American newspapers made a fuss about Bogomolov's presence at our secret staff meeting. For several days I feared that my action would be misinterpreted in Washington. Stanley Levin Allen reassured me by saying, Don't worry, Brad, when the Federal Bureau of Investigation begins its probe, we won't let you off the hook. At 10 a.m. on Thursday, 22 February, the decision was made to force the Rua River at dawn the next morning. The river still had not entered the banks, but we could delay no longer. It had been 22 days since Eisenhower had shifted the direction of our main strike. Now we were not advancing on the Eiffel, but in the direction of the Ruhr River. If we had been allowed to advance through the Eiffel, we would have been well on our way to the Rhine. Each new day of delay allowed the enemy to pull up forces, and it became clear that further strengthening of the defense by the Germans in this area could derail our entire plan. Even now I feared that the war would drag on until September 1945, and that it would reach its highest point in the summer battles in late July and August. If we wanted to force the Rhine at the end of spring, we could no longer chill at the ruin. Meanwhile, the advance of Monty's Canadian army down from Nijmegen, bypassing the Siegfried Line where the front of Dempsey's army was facing it, was soon halted. In 14 days of offensive fighting, the Canadians advanced less than 32 kilometers, overcoming stubborn enemy resistance on terrain eroded by heavy rains and flooded by the Germans, until Simpson did not force the Ruha River and went to the rear of the defending German troops. The commander of the Canadian army, General Creera, could not count on the fact that the Germans weakened resistance. In the area between Durin and Julich, where the muddy waters of the Rufa flowed over the rocky bottom, Simpson, preparing to force the river, concentrated ten divisions, including three armoured divisions, on his right. Hodges pulled up three corps with fourteen divisions. The seventh corps, Collins, was to force the Ruha 23 February at the same time as the Ninth Army. The third and fifth corps forced the river Echelon after the seventh corps. Each division was to cross the Ruha following the division on its left flank and land on the bridgehead, occupied by the latter. Having landed on the eastern bank of the Ruhair, the division would move to the right and return to its offensive line. We drew up such a plan of attack to allow Hodges to dispense with forcing the Rasha on a wide front. He could cross the lead division of the Third Corps to the bridgehead occupied by Collins' last division, then turn it to the right, thus widening the bridgehead until all the divisions of the Third and Fifth Corps had been crossed. With this method of attack, the 1st Army carried out a deep inroad in its line, with the 7th Corps covering the flank of Simpson's 9th Army, which was turning towards Dusseldorf to join the Canadians advancing south. We struck a 40-kilometre strip along the Ruhr River from Durin to Linich and by noon had the first pontoon bridge across the river. The lorries crawled slowly along the gates that had been laid in the woods on the approaches to the river and rolled over the narrow metal belts of the pontoon bridge on rubber rafts. After an unusually harsh winter, the snow began to melt rapidly six weeks ahead of schedule, and our heavy trucks smashed the crushed stone highways that had been laid out in the woods. Many kilometers of asphalted paved highways sank into mud, and even first-class highways became impassable swamps. Five days had passed since we had forced the Ruhr and the German troops were beginning to show the first signs of fatigue. On 28 February, Simpson broke through from his pre-bridge fortification, and three days later joined up with the British Second Army at Gelden, while some of the formations of his Ninth Army were advancing towards the Rhine. Collins was advancing towards the Erft, 
a small muddy river between the Ruh and the Rhine. Once on the earth, he was to make a halt before advancing on the heavily bombed city of Cologne. On 3 March, I ordered Hodges and Patton to launch a surprise offensive, thanks to which for ten days of rapid advance, we cleared the entire territory of Rhineland Palatinate north of the Moselle River Valley and took 49,000 Germans as prisoners. Since then, the enemy has never again been able to mend all the gaps on the Western Front. The fast-moving campaign west of the Rhine was carried out strictly on schedule, with the precision of a well-practiced drill. It was an instructive example of exemplary maneuver. If I were asked which campaign during the entire war I am most proud of as a soldier by profession, I would not hesitate to point to it. All actions west of the Rhine were to be carried out in two successive phases, and for each of them the Army Group headquarters developed a detailed plan of action. 1. While Hodges went to the Rhine between Dasseldorf and Cologne, Patton was to prepare for an offensive from his bridgeheads east of the Kill River. 2. After Simpson reached the Rhine, Hodges would turn Collins' corpse toward Cologne, and the main body of his army would move rapidly southeast and join Patton's columns making their way to the Rhine. As for Patton, his task was to advance through the mountainous region of Eiffel, then make a rush to Koblenz, where at the confluence of the Moselle into the Rhine rose a statue of Kaiser Wilhelm I on horseback. The first phase of the campaign proceeded at a brisk pace. By 5 March, the Seventh Corps had reached the Rhine south of Dusseldorf, and Patton on the east bank of the Kiel River was impatiently awaiting the signal to attack. Three armoured divisions were on standby to join the Third Army's 80-kilometre rush to the Rhine. I ordered the armies to begin the second phase of the campaign and left for Reims the next morning to discuss future plans with Ike. The next day Churchill was expected for lunch, and Ike asked me to stay and wait for the arrival of the British Prime Minister. Churchill arrived shortly before the luncheon began. He was in the uniform of a colonel. I've had enough of the aviation uniform, he said, as if to explain the reason that made him change his uniform. He took a leather cigar case out of his inside pocket, lit a cigar, and took a brandy and soda without waiting to be served. Churchill had visited Simpson the day before, and now spoke enthusiastically about the rapid advance of the Ninth Army. Eisenhower could again treat us to fresh Chesapeake oysters that Steve Early had sent him. Marshal Brooke and I declined our share, I hummed contentedly, and quickly divided our portion among the rest of the guests, not forgetting himself. The conversation turned to Churchill's trip to the troops, and the British Prime Minister spoke of the amazing advances in weaponry that the Allies had made during the wave years. However, his admiration for the new weapons was somewhat overshadowed by the thought that we might have to use them against us. A nation defeated and disarmed in this world war, he said, will already have an advantage in the next war, for it will have created new weapons while we are trying to use old weapons. Even Tedder, the pilot, nodded his head in agreement after hearing the Prime Minister's prediction that the day was not far off when the modern heavy bomber would be completely obsolete. Churchill said that jets would eventually replace manned aeroplanes. And then Britain, he added, would become a huge bazooka aimed at aggressors who dared threaten Europe. Now, perhaps the day will come, Churchill continued, when, in order to start a war, it will be enough to go into the cabinet, break the glass over the switch, put the arrow on the scale against the state to be bombed and press the button. I remembered President Roosevelt hinting 18 months earlier that we would have an atomic bomb. Although I was eager to know the status of this invention, I did not dare to ask even Eisenhower about it. So over lunch, Churchill defended his policy in Greece, where British troops were actively supporting the Greek government against Elas Eish, which was dominated by communists. Churchill's policy was sharply attacked by the English newspapers, the London Times and the Manchester Guardian, and much of the American press, which, Churchill remarked, picked up on what the two papers wrote. But we shall never, he slammed his fist on the table, never, wherever it happens, sit back and watch in cold blood as a minority imposes its will on a helpless majority. He scorned the resurgence of the communist threat to the West and urged us not to believe the tricks of Stalin, 
whom he called Uncle Joe. At the time, I, like most Americans, took for granted the wartime legend of Soviet heroism. But Churchill had long been hostile to the communists many years before the war. He sharply rebutted objections to his policies and compared himself to a giant rhinoceros with a sharp horn and thick hide. Mutty peace, this horn, he said, will always be pointed at the enemy, even if my whole hide were pinned like arrows with critical remarks. On 6 March, as Hodges turned his 9th Armoured Division southeastward across the Erft, Patton cut into the German defences beyond the Kill River. On the operational map in the palace in Namir, where our command post was located, the blue front line stretched in a sharp wedge towards the Rhine. It was Hugh Gaffey's 4th Armoured Division breaking through towards Koblenz. In two days, the division had cut 56 kilometres into the enemy's rear along the forested Eiffel Mountains, but the width of the wedge was no wider than the width of the motorway on which the tanks were moving. This Gaffey offensive was the boldest and most daring tank attack of the entire war on the Western Front. Meanwhile, to Gaffey's left, Patton threw the 11th Armoured Division into action, ordering it to advance in line with the 4th Division. On 8 March, the tank columns of both divisions joined up a few kilometres west of the Rhine, encircling the German troops left behind. The Germans north of the Moselle were now cut off from the Rhine, in the Eiffel Mountains, German units scattered in confusion as American tanks raced full speed toward the Rhine, raising panic in the German rear. Further north, Collins's 7th Corps turned south from Dassydorf to Cologne, where its tanks made their way through the streets of a city reduced to piles of rubble. By some miracle, the old Gothic cathedral survived. Beyond its two spires, the waters of the rain flowed past the collapsed trusses of the Hindenburg Bridge. The retreating German troops had blown up the one and a half kilometre long span of the bridge as our units cautiously approached the outskirts of the city. Only four gloomy towers remained standing over the ruins of the bridge like a tombstone. Moving from the smoky factory town of Eiskirchen, Major General John Leonard's 9th Armoured Division skirted the dense forests of Cothen, heading for the River Eyre, at the point where this mountain stream swiftly flows into the bend of the Rhine halfway between Cologne and Cablac, ten kilometres north on the east bank of the Rhine, close to the town of Remagen, was a group of plastered houses. A single-track railway bridge crossed the Rhine at this location. By the evening of 7 March, under a fine drizzle, the 7th Armour Division approached the R River. One of the division's combat commands turned south to seize a bridgehead on the other side of the mountain stream in the 5th Corps' offensive strips. The other combat command, Brigadier General William Hoagies, headed for the Rhine. Now the enemy on the west bank of the Rhine could no longer mount an organized wreck. German troops fleeing to the Rhine found themselves in a desperate situation when their vehicles were stopped on the roads for lack of fuel. As our tanks passed one town after another, the inhabitants shut the windows of their houses tightly and hung out white sheets. All along the Rhine from Dusseldorf to Koblenz, about two dozen heavy bridges were blown up by bombing teams and collapsed into the water. The bridges at Dusseldorf were blown up just as American vanguards were approaching from the west. A bridgehead on the east bank of the Rhine was our dream, but we had lost all hope of capturing even one bridge intact. I had already resigned myself to the necessity of forcing the river while still in England. That evening I returned to the command post when the curtains on the windows were already closed. Major General Bull, Eisenhower's chief of operations, was waiting for me here. He had just arrived from the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, intending to rock. Command decided to take four of my existing 26 divisions and transfer them to Devers for the invasion of the Saarland. Suddenly there was a phone call. Hodges was calling me from Spire. Murat Bacan, said Courtney and from his calm voice could not assume that he had good news. Brad, we've captured the bridge. The bridge? You mean you captured the bridge over the Rhine intact? Yes, Hodges replied. Leonard captured the bridge at Remagen before the Germans blew it up. Well done, Courtney, I said. We'll make a wide gap here. Have you moved your soldiers to the other side? 
With all the speed we can muster, he said, Tubby is setting up the transport with the sailors, and my engineers are building a couple of pontoon bridges across the river to the bridgehead. I walked over to the map, dragging a long cord behind me. Get everything you can to the other side, Courtney, I said, and make a strong defense of the bridgehead. It will probably take the German a couple of days to gather his strength and strike you. I hung up, turned to Bull, and clapped him on the shoulder triumphantly. Now it's your turn, Pink. Courtney crossed the Rhine over the bridge. Bull squinted and looked at me through his unrimmed glasses. He sat down in front of the map and shrugged. Okay, Brad, you've captured the bridge, but what do you need it for? You can't go on the offensive at Remagen anyway. That's not in the plan. No to hell with the plan, I said. A bridge is a bridge and it could be damn useful to us wherever it is. Bull just shook his head. The plan was to force the Rhine north of the Ruhr with a large force under Monty's command. After all of Monty's demands are satisfied, the Allied High Command could also agree to an offensive in the auxiliary direction. But in this case, the Third Army could receive permission to force the Rhine between Mainz and Karlsruhe. In fact, this forcing of the Rhine in the auxiliary direction was essential to the operation for the two-pronged encirclement of the Ruhr here which I had been advocating since last September. It is true that Eisenhower had not yet made a final decision to limit the forcing of the Rhine in one direction only, that is, the forces of Monty, but in the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force was dominated by English influence. Most of the officers of the supreme headquarters were so favorably disposed towards Monty's proposal that the only possible plan for forcing the Rhine in their view was reduced to Monty's proposed offensive. But although Bull thought it desirable to force the Rhine in the south, even he shared the British point of view. He was therefore firmly convinced that there was no room in the plan for a bridge at Remagen. What the hell do you want us to do? I asked. For us to step back and blow up the bridge? Bull didn't answer anything. I connected with Eisenhower, who was in Reims, to get confirmation of the order I had given to Hodges. The news of the bridge delighted Ike. Oh, it's Brad, he said. Take everything you need to the east bank, but by all means anchor yourself there. We had dinner and returned to headquarters in the evening. My officers greeted the news of the capture of the bridge with joy, considering it our victory, but Bull was not amused. To him, Remagen was only an unfortunate hindrance to the fulfillment of the elaborate plan of the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force. But I'm not suggesting that we abandon your plan, I urged him. Only let us use this bridge to move four or five divisions to the east bank. Maybe you can use them for a diversionary offensive, or maybe we'll reinforce with them our covering group advancing south of the Ruhr. Either we have a ready-made crossing, we've crossed the Rhine, and now that we have a bridgehead, for God's sake, let us use it. Look, Brad, you've crossed the Rhine, but where do you go from here? What are you going to do on the other side? Would you like me to show you? I said. I led Bull to a geographical map of West Germany, illuminated by fluorescent lights. North of the Ruha Sapper selected points where Monty was preparing to force the Rhine with a large force and make the jump to the plains of Westphalia, 320 kilometers to the south, between Mainz and Karlsruhe. The Rhine flows through the valley, and here we chose points for forcing from where we expected to begin the offensive to bypass the Ruhr from the south. Between the northern and southern sections of the forcing the Rhine flows through a rocky gorge, and here it is difficult to choose a place to cross to the right bank of at least one division. Beyond Rimagen, the forested heights of the Westerwald Massif made it difficult to advance eastwards, but 40 kilometers south of Rimagen at Koblenz began the valley of the River Lone, which went east crossed the Westerwald and came out to Gissen, and through Gissen passed the direction of our strike from Frankfurt to cover the Rue from the south. If Hodges was able to reach the motorway ten kilometers east of the Rimagen Bridge, he could use it to skip south into the valley of the River Lahn, and then turn east to Geisen. At Gissen he would link up with Patton and together with him realize the coverage of the Ruhr from the south. Bull studied the map, running his finger over it. At last, he said, 
I'll bet your boys made this map especially for me. It was finished six months ago. I objected when we were still at Verdun. But you know our plans for forcing the Rhine, he said, alluding to Monty's proposed offensive, and now you're trying to change them. Change them. Damn it, Pink. I couldn't help the irritation boiling up inside me. We're not trying to change anything. But now that we've jumped over the bridge, I intend to use it. But Bull couldn't believe I wouldn't try to divert some of the forces from Monty's front. Well, Pike is with you in heart, he explained. But in mind, he realizes the advantage of going north. It was past midnight. And I said goodbye to Bull and went to bed. I could lean in favor of the northern direction. But until March 15, he had not yet decided definitively how to strike on one or two directions. It seemed to him that an offensive in the northern direction is the fastest way to deprive the enemy of the industrial resources of the Ruha. In addition, he agreed with Monty that the route to Berlin through the plains of Westphalia provides the greatest opportunity for maneuver warfare, in which we outnumbered the Germans. But he also realized that if we limited our offensive from the east bank of the Rhine to one direction only, the enemy could concentrate large forces in our path. In a conversation with Eisenhower, I did not particularly enthusiastic about the Westphalian plains, because, although they were flat terrain, they were crossed by many large and small rivers and canals. I argued that the enemy could, without much difficulty, prevent or limit our advance in this neighborhood. In the southern direction from Frankfurt to Kassel, which I proposed to cover the Ruher from the south, was more rugged terrain than the direction of Monty's strike, and in addition, the troops had to travel a longer route. However, this was not decisive, as there were fewer obstacles in this direction. When all the arguments for and against were made, Eisenhower leaned towards the American plan of two-pronged coverage of the rule, despite the fact that his staff preferred the plan put forward by Monty Offensive in one direction. Among other things, Eisenhower saw our plan as an opportunity to take an offensive in another direction, in case Monty failed with his offensive in the north. However, Eisenhower ordered first of all to provide troops, including airborne troops, as well as ferrying equipment to the northern group under Monty's command. If in the south Patton had to force the Rhine near Mainz, his forces would be limited to the American formations that would remain after all of Monty's needs were met. In 30 January, the Joint Chiefs of Staff met on the island of Malta to prepare for the Yelta Conference. At this meeting, the British criticized Eisenhower's decision to accept our plan for the bilateral coverage of the route. They suggested that the Joint Chiefs of Staff instruct Eisenhower to concentrate forces in the northern direction under Monty. Brooke feared how Eisenhower would not concentrate in the southern direction too large forces at the expense of Montgomery's group. However, General Marshall sided with Eisenhower and rejected the British claim. Marshall strongly opposed the plan to concentrate all Allied forces in one single direction. He insisted that Eisenhower was given permission to force the Rhine not only on the main, but also on the auxiliary direction. If the offensive Montgomery in the north will be stopped, the Allies could switch their efforts to the auxiliary direction because General Marshall foresaw that in the northern direction of the Germans will stubbornly resist. Particular fears he was inspired by their jet aircraft. At the same time, Marshall strongly objected to the fact that the Joint Chiefs of Staff to tell the commanders at the fronts how to fulfill their tasks. From the very beginning of the war, General Marshall was an advocate of genuine independence of the commanders of troops. Eisenhower's representative Beadle Smith somewhat reassured the British, announcing detailed data on the number of troops to be allocated to Montgomery in the main direction, the headquarters of the 21st Army Group, making logistical calculations, proceeded from the fact that the group Montgomery, advancing in the north, should not exceed 21 divisions. However, the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force unhesitatingly ordered to increase this figure, allocating Monty first 30, and then 36 divisions. The Southern Covering Force was limited to only about 12 divisions. The remaining Allied divisions on the Western Front were to take up defenses on the west bank of the Rhine. One day after Remagen was taken, I received orders from the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force 
not to concentrate more than four divisions initially on the bridgehead. This restriction was due to the fact that Monty proposed to give him another ten divisions in case he succeeded in breaking through the enemy defences on the east bank of the Rhine. I therefore instructed Hodges to extend the bridgehead by about one kilometre each day, just to prevent the enemy from entrenching and mine the approaches to his front. Hodges was to wait until Eisenhower made a decision regarding the forcing of the Rhine by a large force to the south. If Eisenhower approved our plan for a two-pronged sweep, Hodges was to advance in a southeasterly direction to link up with Patton's forces advancing through Frankfurt. Once linked, the two armies would turn towards Kassel to encircle the Ruhr from the south. The Germans attempted to blow up the bridge at Remagen, which was damaged by the enemy before Hodges's brave tankers leapt across its boardwalk and disconnected the wires leading to the blasting charges. Seeing that we had captured the bridge, the Germans opened artillery fire on it and bombarded it from the air. To cover the bridge and speed up the transfer of troops to the bridgehead sappers of the First Army, put over the swollen Rhine first gauge and then a pontoon bridge. Naval service units unloaded the crossing vehicles from the huge trailers on which they had been delivered overland from the English Channel and organized the transport of supplies across the Rhine. So much anti-aircraft artillery was transferred to the bridgehead that the density of fire was only half that of the anti-aircraft fire we had established at the Normandy bridgehead. Upstream across the Rhine were stretched barriers protecting the bridge from underwater and radio-controlled mines. Team patrols were posted on both sides of the bridge to ensure that enemy saboteurs did not infiltrate the bridge as part of our columns. Barrage aerostats were raised in the air from heights on both banks of the Rhine, and depth bombs were dropped into the water to prevent enemy divers from approaching the bridge unnoticed. Enemy fighter bombers raided the bridge every day, but fortunately their bombs fell into the water without causing damage. On 9 March, however, a long-range artillery shell hit the bridge, damaging it. Traffic on the bridge was disrupted for five hours. Two days later, a new shell struck the bridge. Finally, on 17 March, the bridge swayed, tilted, and collapsed into the water. More than two dozen sappers among the 200 men repairing the bridge at this point were crushed by the collapsed trusses. Many drowned, falling into the icy waters of the Rhine. In the opinion of our engineers, the bridge could have been saved if only it had stood for another 24 hours. However, Hodges had already established himself on the bridgehead at Remagio. He moved four divisions to this patch and expanded it by seizing a wide motorway leading to Frankfurt. At first, the enemy's reaction was delayed. As a result, he was able to concentrate only 20,000 men against this open wound in his side. The German command announced in its communique that three majors and one lieutenant had been executed for not carrying out the order to blow up the bridge. On the same day that Remagen was captured, Bull arrived in Nemur. However, he did not arrive to prevent us from establishing a pre-bridge fortification at Remagen, but to take some troops from us and hand them over to Devers, who was to clear the sire of German troops. After Patton reached the Moselle, only the Sayar Basin remained in enemy hands west of the Rhine. The Siegfried Line separated Patch's 7th Army from the Saar. Although Eisenhower would have preferred to first reach the Rhine on the entire front and then begin to force it, he still did not dare to postpone the day scheduled by Monty to start forcing the Rhine. Therefore, the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force sought to allocate Devers' forces necessary for the rapid seizure of the Saar. Take troops from the Ninth Army could not, as it was part of the grouping of Monty, and enjoyed priority. Therefore, we suspected that our hapless 12th Army group would again have to serve as a donor. Soon after the elimination of the Ardennes Bulge, we had already given Devers three divisions for the offensive on Coma. We feared that in the event of another such creep on our forces we would be completely exsanguinated and the forcing of the Rhine in the southern direction could be disrupted. I foresaw that Devers' attempt to break through the secret line could end in failure and suggested to Eisenhower to turn Patton's troops to the south. Patton could, after crossing the Moselle, break into the sail land from the north and cut off the enemy entrenched in the fortifications from the rear, from the pre-bridge fortification on the south bank of the Moselle near Koblenz, 
Third Army could strike in a southerly direction, go to the west bank of the Rhine and cut the supply line of the enemy. Meanwhile, in the vicinity of Trier on the border with Luxembourg, the Third Army in the period of active defence cleared from the enemy triangle south of the Moselle. From this convenient springboard pattern could make a rush south to the rear of the Siegfried line, flanking its fortifications, while Devers struck them from the front. As soon as Eisenhower heard of my plan, he gave me orders to proceed with its execution. I immediately flew to Luxembourg and outlined my plan to George Patton. I found him cutting his hair in the retirement home in which he had set up his command center. George summoned a second barber, and we discussed our plan while we were given a hot compress. Not only did this plan promise a risky operation bordering on the adventurous, to which Patton instinctively had a special predisposition, but it also gave him the opportunity of dragging Devers' army group through the fortifications of the Siegfried line. At least we won't have to sit around aimlessly, Patton said, while the high command decides whether we should force the Rhine. Devers was, if not hostile to our plan, at least not enthusiastic about it. He was frightened by the idea that the troops of the 6th Army Group could intermingle with Patton's army, advancing in his strip. But the prospect of eliminating so powerful a fortified frontier as the Siegfried Line was too tempting. It could not be rejected and Devers grudgingly agreed. It is clear that now, when this operation was already being developed, I could not go to further transfer to the 6th Army Group Devers of his compounds, but Bull demanded to give Devers three more divisions and reinforcement units. My objections made him furious. For the 1st Army is tantamount to an order to disarm, EY told Bull. You know we can't touch Simpson while he's under Monty's command and George needs all his divisions for the task south of the Moselle. I'm sorry, Pink, but we can't do that. Bull was irritated by my refusal. Damn it, but men like you are extremely difficult to deal with, he said, and I might add that you are becoming a more difficult man every day. Yes, however, I remarked, the High Command has plenty of experience in dealing with difficult people. Bull snapped back. The 12th Army Group is no more difficult to negotiate with than the 21st Army Group. He paused. Not harder, but believe me, not easier. I was angry at Bull's harsh tone, but I had to agree to the transfer of three divisions, which he demanded. However, I refused to give up the artillery divisions. We needed them at Remagen. Now, in the composition of my 1st and 3rd Armies, remained only 27 divisions. At the same time, Monty clung tenaciously to the twelve divisions that had been allocated to Simpson's Ninth Army to force the Rhine. In the south, Devers had eleven American divisions, not counting General de la de Tassini's French army. Hodges, on hearing of my concession to Bull, rushed to me from Spa, angry. They're taking everything away from me, Brad, he complained. How can I make a move on Remagen if they're cutting me off at the route? This is the last time, Courtney. I reassured Hodges. We won't give up another battalion. Fortunately, Bull's demand was indeed the last. The pace of the fighting had quickened to such an extent that the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force no longer had time to create new obstacles for us. As the Third Army prepared to rush south from the bridge fortification on the south bank of the Moselle, with the task of reaching the Rhine near Mainz, Eisenhower could no longer postpone the long-debated question of whether to cover the Ruhr on one or both sides. Smith's question had been brewing for almost half a year now. At the disposal of Montgomery for an offensive in the main direction had already been allocated three armies, the 1st Canadian, 2nd British and 9th American. However, Montgomery was not enough. He demanded that the Supreme Headquarters created him a second echelon of ten divisions, which he proposed to borrow from the First Army. In view of this demand, the Supreme Headquarters at first and proposed to me to limit the grouping on the Remagen Bridgehead to four divisions. If the Supreme Headquarters had satisfied Monty's demand for ten divisions, only one Third Army would have remained under my command. As a result, Patton and I would probably have spent the remainder of the war in defense on the west bank of the Rhine. Fortunately, Eisenhower did not fall for Montgomery's bait.
He told him that if these ten divisions of the First Army would be moved to the northern direction, the headquarters of the Twelfth Army Group would follow with them and take command of the First and Ninth American Armies. As soon as Montgomery learned under what conditions Eisenhower agrees to give him ten divisions, he preferred to stay with what he had and retain monopoly command of the operation for the 21st Army Group. As a result, we won the fight that lasted six months, and Eisenhower was able to resolve the fiercest dispute of the entire war over the tactical plan of action of the Allies. From the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force came the order for the 1st and 3rd Armies to encircle the Rouvre from the south. Over Bull's objections, Remagen was to serve as a springboard for the 1st Army's leap to the Elbe. By 12 March, the 3rd Army had reached the Moselle, all the way from its confluence with the Rhine at Koblenz to the Triangle at Trier, where Walker's 20th Corps had established a bridgehead on the flank of Siegfried's line. Eighteen days had passed since that rainy February morning when Simpson's and Hodges' armies crossed the Ruhr. In that time, we have destroyed the enemy north of the Moselle and west of the Rhine. The first and third armies captured 51,000 people and Montgomery's troops in the north, another 53,000. Our rapid rush to the Rhine took the enemy by surprise. Morale of German soldiers was undermined. The German units, surrounded, without resistance, surrendered to capture. Hitler hoped that the defense of the homeland will cause a morale boost and strengthen the army and the people's will to resist. But the consciousness that the war was lost acted depressingly on the German soldiers. Only the fanatics continued to cling to any illusion, but their ranks were rapidly thawing. The process of disintegration proceeded with such rapidity that even the German commanders lost contact with their crumbling front. One day, a German corps commander drove up to a large group of apathetic soldiers and asked why they were not fighting the Allies. Only after an American military police soldier put his hand on his shoulder and invited him to join the crowd of soldiers did the German general realize that he was in a prisoner of war camp. Seston concentrated nine divisions for a swift invasion of the Saarland. Five divisions stretched along the Moselle River Valley from Luxembourg to the Rhine. The remaining four crowded into the hilly terrain in a triangle southeast of Trier. Not twenty-four hours after reaching their initial positions on the Moselle, the Third Army stormed into the Sayre. Let Devers get out of the way, Patton declared to me, otherwise we will sweep him away with the Hans. Sometime before this, having met Patton in Luxembourg, I had asked him if the Third Army was going to carry crossing equipment with it during the Rhineland Pals offensive. Indeed, why not, he replied, but I've already had most of it stripped away. I haven't forgotten the tenacity with which George clung to his pontoons during the Ardennes, when the question of changing the boundaries between the armies came up. Now perhaps you ought to keep your crossing gear on hand, I said. I want you to cross the Rhine on the move. We must not stop to prevent the enemy from gaining a foothold, pulling up forces and giving us hell when we start to cross. Simpson has already complained to me about Monty's order to halt on the west bank of the Rhine when the Ninth Army had a full opportunity to force the river and overcome weak enemy resistance. Since then, Monty's spectacular preparations to force the Rhine had attracted the attention of the enemy who had concentrated large forces in this area. I foresaw that when advancing in the Sayar, Patton might encounter difficulties in the Hunsruck Mountains beyond the Moselle, but this time I underestimated the swiftness and crushing impetus of the Third Army's bold offensive. Hugh Gaffey's Fourth Armoured Division was again in the vanguard of the advancing force. Before the enemy came to his senses, the American tanks had already crossed the forested Hunsruck mountain range. In two days, Hugh Gaffey's tank columns advanced south to the Nahi River near Bad Kresnik. Here Patton stopped them and brought in reinforcements. In Neymar, my headquarters waited anxiously for Patton to push his column from Bad Kresnik further east to the Rhine, from which it was only forty kilometers away. Why the hell did the old man stop? complained one of the staff officers. However, I relied on George's keen sense of the situation. Hmm, Patton knows what he's doing, I replied. Wait a little while and you will see that I am right. Not a day later, 
when the enemy counterattacked us on the site of the 4th Armoured Division, but Patton, who had time to pull up reinforcements and gain a foothold, threw back the Germans and, as if nothing had happened, continued to advance. It should be said that the intelligence before this nothing reported on the preparation of the Germans' counterattack, but Patton foresaw it with that characteristic for him intuition, which helped him to become a great commander. Equally spectacular was Walker's offensive from the Trier area. He swept south past the concrete casemates of the Siegfried line, cutting them off from the rear. Before the operation began, Patton had given the 20th Corps two more divisions. It was now the largest corps of the Third Army in the entire war. Six days later, both groups of the Third Army, operating from the Koblenz and Trier area, joined south of the Nei River, fleeing from American tanks overhanging his flanks and breaking through to the rear. The enemy abandoned the Siegfried line, and Devers quietly led his troops through it. The Rhine in its middle course, halfway between its delta in the North Sea and its source in the Alps, makes a sharp turn at Marnes, and then enters a rocky gorge, and carries its swift waters along it to Bonn. Between Mannheim and Mainz the banks of the river are gentle, flowing among the meadows and plains of Hesse, providing an easy route to the industrial district of Frankfurt, which was badly damaged by bombing. Along these plains Patton directed his lead tank columns. It is on the morning of 23 March, when I went down to breakfast, the wide windows of our dining room in the Chateau de Nama were flooded with sunlight. Below, the Sambra was leisurely rolling its waters into the broad, seemingly lifeless mayors. To the north, a formation of bombers, leaving white ribbons of smoke in the air behind them, was heading for the Ruhr. I had just finished my second cup of coffee when I got a call from Patton at his command post. Brad, don't tell anyone, but I've moved. Nips, I'll be damned if I did, over the Rhine? Of course, he replied. Last night I moved a division to the east bank unnoticed, but there are so few guns here that it has not yet reached their consciousness, so don't tell anyone. We'll keep it quiet for now and see what happens. This message was confirmed at the morning meeting. Patton's young liaison officer at 12th Army Group Headquarters, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Steelman, a native of Paris, Kentucky, solemnly handed me George's written report. Steelman's face shone with delight. It expressed the pride felt by the Third Army, which quietly crossed the Rhine under cover of darkness, while in Montgomery defiantly accumulated forces, preparing to force the Rhine in the north. The report relayed by Steelman contained a number of ironic allusions to Montgomery's careful preparations. Without the aid of bomber aircraft, smoke screens, artillery preparation and airborne troops, the Third Army forced the Rhine River at 2200 hours on Thursday 13 March. The 5th Infantry Division crossed on rafts and assault landing boats to the east bank near the small village of Oppenheim. It was the first time in history that a modern army had crossed such a significant body of water as the Rhine, losing only 34 men killed and wounded in the process. In the evening, Patton called me on the phone again. Rad, he shouted into the receiver, and his excited voice trembled. Now, for God's sake, tell the world that we have forced the Rhine. Today we shot down 33 aeroplanes trying to destroy our pontoon bridges. Let the whole world know that the Third Army forded the Rhine before Monty did.